All right, in this video, we're going to show you how to do object detection in real time using YOLO V8, as you can see here in this live camera feed. I'll be going over their repo here, as well as some of the performance metrics that they look at to compare the different models and jump into the coding that's required to get that program up and running. Before we jump into the main topic of this video, if you're new to my channel, this channel is all about robotics, controls, machine learning, and computer vision, so subscribe to learn more. I have a bunch of playlists on computer vision, software, mechanical. This one's on OpenCV, ROS2, Python, C++, Git, mechanical design, SOLIDWORKS, and here's my GitHub that goes along with it. So let's jump back into the topic of this video. So as you can see here, this is the repo under Ultralytics. And you can see that here's a graph here that shows some of the uh, performance. So you can see YOLO V8 is here in the dark blue. And for those that are new, there's this term here called MAP. So I have in my repo here, I defined it for you guys. So MAP is the mean average it's the mean average precision. So it's calculated at the intersection of union for thresholds from 50 to 95% in 5% increments. And then you have a param, which is the number of parameters in millions. So that's typically how they define it. And here you can see as an image what defines the IOU. So you have your ground truth and your prediction, and IOU is the area of overlap divided by area of union. So that's how they're defining IOU. So if we go back to this repo, you can see that here, if the parameters get higher, you typically will have better performance. And as you have fewer parameters, then your parameters, your performance will get worse. So there's definitely a trade-off. And you can see some of the older uh, YOLO models definitely is performs much worse than the new V8 model. And here you can see they're running on uh, Tensor RT here, but you can see that this here is showing you how fast they calculate it and the performance based on how fast it's going. So here you can see that uh, you have different sizes. The NSMLX is a different model size. So the bigger your model size, um, the longer it takes to compute your prediction. And the smaller your model, it'll be less accurate, but it's going to be much faster. So that's going to be your trade-off. So here we have, um, as you can see, all these models are trained from Coco. So if you look at Coco, it's just um, it's all about the common objects. So it stands for common objects and context. So if you look through here, the type of objects that it's trained on is things like persons, bicycle, cars basically common objects that you'll see in your daily life. And that's what this data set is basically trained on. So those are the things that it'll be good at detecting, okay? So here you can see these are the different model types. You have the VN, S, M, L, X with increasing size. And you can see that um, the bigger the model, the more parameters we're dealing with. And as a trade-off, you can see that, well, it's gonna take longer because um, it takes more time to compute, but your accuracy, the MAP, is going to be a little bit better. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the coding involved to get this up and running. So if we look at my repo here, it's pretty simple. Uh, what you want to do is, my current setup right now, I'm using a GTX 1650 Ti. It's a pretty weak, uh, pretty weak GPU running on Windows 10. So I set up my virtual environment here using this command and I just activated it running in Python 3.11. And all you need to do is do pip install ultralytics and you should have your whole environment up and running. So here's the simple script that I made. You could say from ultralytics, import YOLO, and then from enum, import enum. Here I defined my model types here, the three different types. As you can see, these are the different sizes that we're dealing with. So I have my camera set up where I have a Logitech and my laptop. I ended up using my laptop because it doesn't like detecting two cameras as I'm recording. So I will be defaulting to my laptop here. 
And then I have a simple function called live object detection, which will do the detection in real time. And here I choose my model type. I have two uh, instances where I'm doing two examples. And then this main function here, predict, will do the prediction in real time. So if we run the first one, this is a large model. You can see how long it takes to detect. Okay, so you can see my detection is up and running and it thinks this thing here is a hair dryer, hair, hair dryer and uh, at least this knows that I'm a person and there's a chair in my back. Um, I have my phone here, you can see, let's see if you can figure out this is, yeah, you can tell it's a cell phone, so that's good. I have a mouse here, you can see if it could detect my mouse. Sometimes you can see it thinks it's a hot dog at some point, a sports ball. Okay, so at some point I could see it's a mouse, you could saw that uh, it's 0.64, and it's really dependent on the angle, as you can see, so this angle here is a pretty good angle for it. Um, sometimes it'll think it's a donut. I don't know if I could recreate it again, but sometimes if I hold it at a weird angle, it doesn't does it doesn't know that it's a mouse. So that's kind of where some of the training is required, is because you wanted to train it for the specific object you're d detecting, and you want to give it more views to be better at it. So let's take a look at the smaller model. You'll see the the refresh rate is a lot faster. This one is pretty slow, it's at a thousand milliseconds, so that's why you see a lot of delay. So let's take a look at the smaller model and see how that one performs. So this one here is the small model and you can see that it's much faster. Um, right, right off, you can see that it's sometimes detecting this as a cell phone here and a bottle. Uh, let's see if our cell phone works again. So you can see, it thinks my fingers are hot dogs. I guess it does look like it. But you can see this is a cell phone, which is pretty good. As before, sometimes it thinks it's a skateboard. Now it thinks it's a remote. So you can see it's not perfect. Let's do our same mouse test that we did earlier. So you can see that um, if I had a similar angle as I did before, it can't quite pick up this mouse anymore. So you can see that you know, here it thinks it's a bottle. Um, so you can see that definitely the smaller model is not as good, even though it's faster. You can see the number of parameters does make a difference. So you can see it's having a hard time detecting this mouse. If I move it at different angles, it thinks it's a remote now. So yeah, you can see it's having a pretty hard time detecting this mouse here. See if I get even closer, if we can do a better job. So you can see that it's still kind of struggling. I it think it's a frisbee for a second there, as you can see. But let's give it another common object. You can see this is my cup. It thinks it's a cell phone. But let's see how the angle changes its detection. So you can see when it's tilted, it thinks it's a cup. So that's a good sign. So here it thinks it's a cup. Sometimes it thinks it's a wine glass. Uh, but basically it's very dependent on the view of the object. And it thinks it's a cell phone now, so that's not good. But you get the idea. So uh, for most applications, if you want this to be very good, you probably need to do some training. Otherwise, if it's for basic objects and you have good lighting conditions and good view angles of the object, then this may work right off the bat. Okay, so if you found this video helpful, give a like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.